1 Kings 18. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. 1 Kings 18. This is when Ahab confronts Elijah, and Elijah is confronting Ahab. In fact, Elijah is going up to do battle with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And in verse 17, which was read earlier, it says, And it came about when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? All of the apostate kings, priests, prophets, so on and so forth, whenever the prophet comes, they always get on the prophet's case, and they blame the prophets for their problems. But look what the prophet says. And he said, Elijah, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. In other words, how do you trouble your house? You forsake the commandments of the Lord. That's what he's saying. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at whose table? Jezebel's table. And tonight, folks, you're in for a treat. Because what you're going to see is you're going to see the spirit of Elijah confront the prophets of Baal and Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And as I go into this, the thing I want you to prepare yourself for is ask yourself and make sure that you're not sitting there, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that you're not sitting at that table, at Jezebel's table with Baal and Asherah. So are you ready? Elijah says, it's you, you have troubled Israel because you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Isn't that amazing how my first passage of scripture is the commandments of the Lord? In fact, it's the first of the Ten Commandments. How many of you believe in the Ten Commandments? Okay, praise the Lord. Exodus 20, verse 1, God says this, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord. And that word there, whenever you see the word Lord capitalized like that in the Bible, it's his most ancient most sacred memorial name, Yahweh. It's yod Hey vav Hey. Those are the Hebrew letters. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I want to stop right here. God gives us first two commandments. No other gods, no idols. And then in the midst of that, right after the second commandment, he gives us a promise. And what he's going to tell us here now is that the blessings and the cursings are based on the first two commandments. Everything else is simply loving God and having no idols. It's all the other commandments are simply that that application in our lives. And you're going to see that here tonight. So what God does here now, he's going into the Torah. Actually, the word Torah means teaching and instruction. And Torah is much more than law because the Torah includes the history of creation, the history of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Amen? of Joseph and the 12 tribes. So the Torah is more than just, quote, the Mosaic law. But within the Torah is the Mosaic law. And as I said, the first two commandments are God's primary commandments, no other gods and no idols. And then all the other commandments explain how you apply those in life, across the board, including, and I'm dealing especially with the worship of other gods in this particular case. He says in Deuteronomy 4, verse 15, he says, So watch yourselves carefully, since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. Why does he say that? He says that simply because of this. The reason why God says, do not have any idols, is because God is spirit. Is that right? And when he revealed himself to Israel on that day, there was no form of a physical God. And that's why in order to really, really, truly worship the Lord in spirit and truth, in order to venerate Him properly, you have to be able to do it without any idols, without any images. How many of you know that's sometimes tough? We always want to have something to grab onto, you know, it's just a contact point. No, the Lord says you worship me in spirit and you worship me in truth. 
It's the pagans. It's those who worship other gods that have to have idols. The real truth is that the other gods, the pagan gods, they don't have any real power to bring you the everlasting life that he does by his spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my what? My spirit, says the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. So now he goes on, least you act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of a male or a female. Look at the imagery here. In other words, we can't make any images of men or of women. Verse 17, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth, the imagery. The imagery is no winged or walking animals, or fish. Amen? Verse 19, And beware lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. The imagery here, again, worshiping other gods. The sun, the moon, the stars, and this also includes the planets. The heavenly host. And you have to understand, one of the reasons why people back in those days were so attracted to worship the heavenly host and the constellation is because if you go outside and you stand still and you look up into the sky for an hour, the stars move. Actually, it's us that's moving, but because we're stationary on the earth, it looks like the stars rotate, doesn't it? And that's why people worship the stars, because when they saw the stars move and they saw the moon go across the sky and the sun go across the sky, they interpreted that as being alive. And so they worship them because they thought that they were alive and they were moving. And so God gives us command and says, don't worship them because they're not alive. I am the only true and living God. Amen. How many of you know it would have taken back in those days? It would have taken a lot of faith. Amen. Yeah, because so many people were worshiping the stars because they move, they move, yeah, they're alive. See, that was part of the issue. God further clarifies his first two commandments in the Torah. Exodus 34, verse 12. Watch for yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, lest it become a snare in your midst. But rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram. Again, the imagery we're looking here. We're looking at sacred pillars, and that's a pillar of Baal, and you'll see that here in a minute. And the Asherim, which is just an earlier form, the plural form of Asherah, okay? Verse 14, For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and sacrifice to their gods, and someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice. And you must understand that the worship of other gods always led to a pagan feast where there was pagan food and a pagan ceremony that went along with it, and it looked a little bit like this. If I was a pagan, I would take my offering and I would go up to the temple of my pagan god and I would have the priest sacrifice that animal, whatever it is. And then I would eat that sacrifice and then I would drink the blood and then I would go into the temple. To How many of you ever heard of temple prostitutes in the Bible? Yeah, temple prostitutes. Then I would go into the temple and I would find myself a temple prostitute and I would commit an act of fornication with her in order or him, depending on which way you were going. And that would then consume and bring me together to be at one with that pagan God. That is a perversion of what we would call our communion service today. Does everybody understand? We take the bread and we take the grape juice. That is symbolic of the body and the blood of our God, the Passover lamb. Is that right? Amen? And that's okay, but we can't drink blood. But in the pagan world, they drink blood. How many of you would violate these passages of Scripture? Anybody? No. Gosh, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Well, the end time church of Pergamos, Revelation 2 verse 12 says this. You must understand the book of Revelation, the message to the seven churches is to the church universal 
And it's not just during John's time. And it's not during just the different church ages. But every single message to the seven churches has been in the church ever since John's day. You must understand that. If you go and you look at all of those characteristics that are in those churches that Jesus addresses, and these are actually red letters now. These are Jesus' words, not mine or not even John's, okay? These are Jesus' words. You must understand that these messages are to the church until Yeshua, until Jesus comes. So he's saying to us today, he's saying, and to the angel of the church at Pergamos, right, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. In the Hebraic culture, the understanding of where Satan dwells is where the commandments of God are not taught. That's just what the Hebrews teach, okay? But Balaam's teaching is in the church. Let's read verse 14. But I have a few things against you. In other words... Jesus is speaking to the church, the saved church at Pergamos. And he's saying, you're doing all of these really good things, but, everybody say, but. Okay, but I have a few things against you. Jesus has something against us, the church? Yeah, absolutely he can. Because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. King James Version says acts of fornication. Wow, kind of sounds like Exodus 34. What I just read, doesn't it? And here's the kicker, folks. Jesus is saying this is in the church throughout the whole church, the whole church age. How many of you know this is in the church today, if that's true? How many of you believe God's word is true? Amen. So we have to understand, if we really, really, really believe that God's word is true, then this is being taught in the church, the saved church, who are doing works for the Lord. It's in the church today. (gasps) You see, Balaam teaches the church to fornicate with other gods, that's spiritual adultery, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Same way with the church of Thyatira. Revelation 2, verse 18. Who was Ahab's wife? Jezebel. Ooh. The church of Thyatira. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. In fact, the word here for deeds has the connotation of supernatural ministry, supernatural healings and deliverance. So Jesus is saying to the church of Thyatira, you guys, man, you're doing such a good job and you're moving and you're ministering and you're touching people and you're winning the lost and you're healing them and so on and so forth. But, everybody say, but. but. Yeah. But I have this against you. See, the church is eating at Jezebel's table. That you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality. Again, that's act of fornication, and eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, if the word of God is true, That means that Jezebel is in the church and she is teaching God's people and leading them astray so that they would commit acts of fornication. And we're talking about spiritual fornication now. It does roll over into actual physical fornication, but we're talking about spiritual fornication. Harlotry with other gods is what we're dealing with here. Okay, It's a spiritual aspect of it. We're going to stick with that for now. So now, folks, let me ask you this. In order to find out about the teaching of Balaam and what Jezebel did and what her table is at and all what this is all about. How many of you know that none of this is in the New Testament? It refers to it, but it's none of it's in the New Testament. Is that right? So where do we have to go to find out and learn about it? <gasps> Got to go back to that old Torah. Yeah. I want to tell you what, folks. You better pick up your Bible and start reading the Old Testament because the Old Testament are the laws of God and the laws of God do not pass away. They are forever. 
The devil comes along and he skews it and he twists it and he disguises certain things. But if we will take the law of God, like the New Covenant model says, and write it on our heart, is that what the New Testament's about, the New Covenant? It's about writing the Torah on the heart? That's a New Covenant model. If we write the Torah, the laws of God on our heart, guess what? When one of these false gods that I'm about to show you comes at us, we can go, that's not God. Well, how do you know? Because I've got His laws written on my heart. My salvation and my walk with God is more than a confession and an offering. That's what a large part of the Western church is defaulted to now, is a confession and a seed faith offering, and pray the prayer of Jabez four times a day, and everything's going to be okay. I want to tell you what, that's a lie from the pit of hell, and there are people that are going down the tubes believing that. It will never turn around for them with that type of formula, because it's not God's formula. We go back to 1 Kings eighteen nineteen. See, there it is, right there. Now then, send, this is when Elijah said, and I'll read it again. Now then, send and gather to me all the prophets are at Mount Carmel together with the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Paul calls this the table of demons. How many of you know that one? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about the table of God, the table of the Lord, the cup of blessing. The cup of blessing is the third cup of the Passover meal. For those of you who have ever celebrated a Passover, the third cup of the Passover meal is called the cup of blessing. So when Paul is referring to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's referring to the Passover as being the table of the Lord. Was he the Passover lamb? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's why that's the table of the Lord. But you cannot, and Paul says, you cannot eat at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. This is the mixing that God says you don't do because I am Kodesh. I am holy. I am sanctified. I am set apart from the false gods. And because I created you to be like me, therefore you shall be holy like me. You'll be set apart from the false gods. In other words, you won't worship me the way they worship their gods. In other words, we can't take a pagan holiday a pagan celebration, and say, well, we're just going to put Jesus in there and baptize it and give it the sign of the cross, and poof, it's Christian. (laughs) That's the hocus-pocus Christianity, folks, and I want to tell you, there's no power in it. Hallelujah. Jezebel's heritage. Because, see, I really want to deal with Jezebel. You can go into a church and do a house cleaning with Jezebel and deal with all the surface issues of control and manipulation and backbiting and all of that kind of stuff that she manifests. But if you don't deal with Jezebel's table and the root of what gives her her power, even if you do a house cleaning and all the Jezebels are gone, guess what? If we're sitting down at Jezebel's table, you know what's going to happen, don't you? She's going to rise up again because she's got a base. She's got a platform. So we're going to expose her where she's at. Jezebel was the daughter of Ithbael. Ithbel was the king of Sidon and the high priest of Asherah. Ithbel killed his brother, Felice, who was the king of Tyre. And then he went down to Tyre and he took over Tyre and he became the king of Tyre as well as the high priest of Baal. So what he did was he effectively brought Baal worship and Asherah worship together. They were kind of like the, the mama and the papa of the pagan world at that particular point in time. It was kind of emerging. He brought those two together, and they fed off each other. Sidon and Tyre were also commercial centers for Asia Minor. Tyre was actually on the coast and was a seaport, and then Sidon was a little bit north and inland, and it was a commercial center for a lot of the travelers. Both government and commerce came under the influence of the city gods, Baal and Asherah. So when commerce and government come under religion, you must understand that is ultimately the mystery of how the Babylonian system works. There's a financial, a political, and a religious center or form or foundation of worship. We'll get to that in just a minute. Jezebel inherited Ithbel's political, financial, and spiritual model But Ithbel's model was built around Mystery Babylon. What's coming in the last days? What's it called? 
It's called in Revelation 17, it's the woman that rides the beast. What does the Bible call it? It calls it the mystery of Babylon. Guess what? If we're ever going to find out what the mystery of Babylon is, where do we have to go look? We've got to go look at Babylon. That means we've got to go back to that darn old, old Testament again to find out what the heck's going on today, man. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Don't throw that book away, folks. That's a big one. There's three elements of an empire, political system, economic system, and a religious system. This is the power, and I believe that the Jezebel spirit, that seducer, that spiritual stronghold of the last days, I believe that she's the essence of the woman that's on the beast. She is that seductress that's on that beast. And these three elements, when you read Revelation 17, you'll see that it is a demonic blend of economics, politics, and religion. It all comes together. It talks about the merchants of the earth, talks about religion, and it talks about the kings. The ten kings are even in there. Amen? We're not going to teach on that. We're just going to mention it to you. Jezebel is the standard bearer for the mystery of Babylon. I'm laying a foundation for you so it's going to be easier to comprehend what you're about to see. Jezebel is the standard bearer for the mystery of Babylon. Jezebel weaves the religious imagery and beliefs of Baal and Asherah into the social, political, and architectural fabric of nations including the United States, unfortunately. Jezebel secretly injects Baal and Asherah worship into the nation's religious expression. And we're really going to deal with this in our next meeting. Jezebel ultimately seduces the nations to sit down at her table and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I'm specifically talking about tonight, Baal and Asherah. There are a lot of other idols, but these are the two real big ones that we need to deal with in the church. Baal and Asherah worship. This is a picture here. You can see these images. On the left is a picture of Baal, and on the right is a picture of Asherah. But Baal and Asherah didn't originate in Canaan in the Middle East. Baal and Asherah go all the way back to where? Babylon. Yeah. Now, they weren't called Baal and Asherah in Babylon. They were under different names. In fact, Baal originated as Marduk in Babylon. I'm going to give you one little taster for next week. It actually goes back further than Marduk. But we're going to leave that for next week. Because we need this foundation tonight in order to be able to receive what I'm going to minister in the next meeting. Okay? So, it goes back to Marduk. But it does go back one step further, and, and I'll disclose that to you next week, okay? But Baal originated in Babylon as Marduk. And one of the things I want to point out now, I'll, I'll deal with it later, but do you see those horns right there on Baal's helmet as it comes out? He's generally always got horns somewhere. You can even see down there on the right-hand side, that's a legged dragon. What's on top of his head? Horns, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. This is Marduk now, after the world kingdom moved from Babylon, uh, Nimrod's Babylon, it went down to Egypt. And in Egypt, Marduk took on the image of Osiris of Egypt. How many of you have heard of Osiris? Yeah, most of us have heard of Osiris, okay? I'm going to leave Baal and Marduk and even Baal for right now. We're going to come back in a little bit. I want to talk about Asherah tonight mainly. In our next meeting, we're really going to dive into Baal and Marduk of Babylon as it relates to the religious side of things, okay? Now, Asherah originated as Ishtar, the mother goddess of Babylon. How many of you ever heard that before? Have you heard the name Ishtar? If you haven't, that's where it comes from. Ishtar is known as the goddess of fertility, the goddess of sensuality and desire, the goddess of freedom and liberty, the goddess of war, moon goddess, and the planet goddess, Venus. How many of you ever heard that book that's written, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus? Well, see, the male side of that, even Marduk, was Mar is Mars. That's his planet. Ooh, yeah, that's where it comes from. Here's what she says. And I pulled this right off of a pagan website, an Ishtar website. So this is what they worship. This isn't something I made up, okay? 
Bigger than the mountains am I, the empress of the gods am I, the what? Queen of heaven am I, the earth's mistress am I. How many of you ever read in the Old Testament where it talked about the queen of heaven and how Israel fell into the worship of the queen of heaven? Yeah, see, that's in Jeremiah, big time, chapter 2 and chapter 4. We might get to that in our next meeting. Asherah now becomes, again, as Babylon, the world kingdom, moves its power base from Babylon down to Egypt after Nimrod and the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire. Asherah becomes Isis, who is the mother goddess of Egypt. And you'll see there that on the top of her head, you'll actually see Baal's horns and also his sun burst. And Baal was a... You'll see it right there. Baal was the god of creation, and he had a lot to do with the god of nature, vegetation, trees, things on that order. However, he was also, when you put it all into one image, it was always the sun, because that was the thing that governed the earth. It gave us warmth and gave us light and made things grow and so on and so forth. You can see down right here, you can see these pagan crosses, these onks. There's even some Christian religions that use those today. We won't mention any names, at least not at this point. And you can even see, what's this little guy right here? Yeah, a rabbit. What's that emphasize? Fertility. You see, because she was the goddess of fertility. She was the one who made everything go. You know what I mean? Okay. Isis also became Athena of Greece because when the world kingdom then moved to Greece, you know, because after Egypt, it went back to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Then it went to the Mede Persians. Then it went to Greece under Alexander the Great. And this fertility goddess was raised up in Greece as Athena, who was also a goddess of war and a goddess of liberty and a goddess of all of the other things that it takes in order to be able to have success and so on and so forth. And one of the things you'll see here, and I pointed it out, is you'll see this spear, this staff that she has. And this is imagery that I don't have to explain a lot because you'll see it as we move along and how it has transformed over the years. Athena was also Minerva in Rome. And you'll see here's a statue of Minerva. And then here's another statue of Minerva. And I want you to take special note of this right here. Because this is one of the sacred pillars that we mentioned earlier. When the Lord said, don't, that you're supposed to tear down their sacred pillars. And this particular sacred pillar that's broken in half has to do with Marduk that we're going to talk about next week, okay? I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Is everybody understanding what I'm saying? It can be complicated, and I really tried to simplify it so everybody, all the cows can eat, so to speak, amen? Here we see on the state of New Jersey's seal, who is that right there? Yeah, is that Athena? I'd say so. And I don't have time to teach it, but you see this little hat right here? That's called a freedom hat. And the freedom hat is what all of the slaves that were set free by Athena back in Greece and in Rome, they would wear those freedom hats because she was the, quote, goddess of freedom. And it wasn't about, like, freedom in Jesus. It was about the freedom to just do whatever you want. Yeah. And how many of you know that that teaching has come into the church? Don't talk to me about the laws of God. I'm free in Jesus. I can do what I want. Ooh, is that an attitude in the church today? Yeah, yeah. Don't try to put any laws on me, boy. I'm free in Jesus. I can do what I want. Well, let's see. Athena is America's freedom goddess, a.k.a. her name is Columbia. Can anybody tell me where this little baby is perched? Ooh. Oh, good. <laughs> and you're saying, I knew this guy was not a patriot. <laughs> I just knew he was a bad guy. How many of you know that Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares? Is that right? The field 
is the world. The Lord comes and he plants the good seed. But then the devil comes and plants the bad seed. They said, should we tear up the bad seed? He said, no, let them grow up together until the what? Harvest. And I don't have time to teach on it in this series because I've only got two hours. But I do have a series called Jezebel in the Marketplace where I go in and I deal with the financial system. And I teach more on how all of that works and how our country was built upon Biblical Judeo-Christian values. Amen. Yes, absolutely. But you must understand that there was wheat that did a lot of the foundational stuff, but how many of you know there were still tares that got in? And the tares have continued to grow, but you know the wheat is growing as well. How many of you know there's a righteous people in the United States? Amen. There's a bunch of us sitting right here. And so this is where the battle is. It's between the spirit of Elijah and the table of demons. It's the table of the Lord or the table of demons. Elijah or Jezebel? Elijah or Baal? In fact, Elijah's, one of his last things that he said to Israel was, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. If Baal is God, serve him. But if Yahweh is God, serve him. Don't be messing around and floating back and forth between the two camps. How many of you know when you get to the last day, on that day when you stand before him, you better have your ducks in a row, because if you don't, guess what? It's all over. There's no reverse and rewind. You know, you can't change it. It's You're there in front of the Lord, and you've got to answer. Is that right? Yeah. Is it getting worse out there, or is it getting better? How many think it's getting better out there? Is it getting worse out there? Yeah. I want to tell you this. It's going to get worse. And you don't even have to be prophetic to know that. You can be pathetic and understand that that's coming. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so we see here that the tares have gotten in, and the tares, and you must understand that the architecture, the pagan Babylonian architecture is a big deal because it claims certain areas. And this is on the Capitol building overlooking the whole Capitol. Ooh. Athena and Minerva were also Juno of later Rome. And Juno is also Libertus of later Rome. You remember when they built that freedom goddess over in Tiananmen Square? That's what this is right here. And they didn't call it the Statue of Liberty. They said it's the freedom goddess. That's what they called it, remember? Yeah, on TV, the whole thing. I want you to understand that one of the reasons why the Chinese wouldn't let that come in isn't because they were anti-American. It's because they understood that that was a pagan goddess. And they said, we're not going to have it here. We have our religion. Even though their religion is wrong, I mean, it's not truth. But you must understand, they said, we're not going to let that pagan religion come in here. That's one of the reasons why they dealt with it as hard as they did. And I know that. Because I go to Asia a lot, and I have people who know people in the Chinese government, and that was one of the reasons. And I said, amen, I know that. See, but if we don't understand that, we think it's just anti-American stuff. I wish we'd do that in America. Libertus is also Lady Liberty of the American Revolution. Yeah. And look at this picture for just a moment, folks. Look at her, would you? I can't look at her for very long because then I start to go over the edge where I shouldn't go. Now think about it. What are those guys looking at? Are they focused on the war? Uh-uh. You must understand the spirit behind that is not a godly spirit. Even though we say it's the liberty because, see, it maintains the American way of life. I want to tell you, I'm a patriot of America, but I'm a patriot of the kingdom of God first. Because when Jesus comes back, how many of you know he's not coming back to America? Yeah, he might visit, but he's coming back where? To Jerusalem. And here's another big surprise. Jesus is not a Republican. (laughs) I know that that shatters some of your hopes and dreams for the future, but he's not. He's a Torah-observant high priest Jew who not only walked in the commandments of God and fulfilled them, But he said, you go and you walk like I did. Ooh. Libertus is Lady Liberty on our early money. This is a one ounce of gold, St. God, 1926. 
Yeah. I mean, Jesus said, you know, whose reflection is on the coin? Is that right? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. You've got to understand that the world always puts its gods on its money because it's a graven image. How many of you know on biblical money you can't put images of people or anything on there, okay? You can have images of like Israel has the menorah, but that's a symbol of God's light and so on and so forth. It's not an image of a god, but you've got to understand that the St. Gaudens thing, this is an image of a false god. Even though it was called that St. Gaudens made it and so on and so forth, it was Lady Liberty. What's it say right across the top? Look at that. It says Liberty right across the top, doesn't it? Oh, you knew this was coming. I mean, you knew that the minute you saw Juno, right? Yeah. In fact, the Statue of Liberty, that's not the name of it. It's called Liberty Enlightening the World is the technical name of it. And this, unfortunately, folks... It was a gift from the French Freemasons to the Freemasons of New York. And on the placard on the bottom, you can see this Masonic emblem and everything that's on there. Right here, you can see the compass and the square. The Statue of Liberty represents also Lucifer. And I'm a former Freemason, so when I talk about this stuff, I'd say former I know what I'm talking about because I studied it, and that's one of the reasons why I left the Freemasons. It's because although when you go in, you feel like, man, this is just a godly organization, but when you get down to the foundation of it, you get past all the surface stuff, and you get to the foundation of it, you must understand that it is a Luciferian teaching that you only really come to understand when you get to the higher levels. But if you'll study it out, you'll understand that it's a worship of Lucifer in the end who... They call the light, this God of light. But she is the light-bearing goddess of Freemasonry, is Lucifera. Oh, and Columbia Pictures. Holy cats! Well, I mean, where does Jezebel rest more than any place, I think? Would you say Hollywood? Yeah, so you, I'm not crazy, am I? This is a reality, folks, and you want to know what? We're smack dab in the middle of it. Welcome to the last days. And I'm here to help you understand so the devil doesn't eat your proverbial lunch because this whole thing is going to be shaken. And when it's shaken, the devil's going to come along and he's going to disguise some of this stuff and he's just going to offer us a little different variety of things, but it's going to be the same spirit behind it. And that's why we have to understand the difference between the foundations of God that are in his Torah and the foundations of the world that causes us to sit down and eat at the table of demons. Now, Columbia, which is Asherah, which is Ishtar, oversees our political and our commercial systems. Think about it. The harbor of New York is the commercial center of the world. I mean, that is the biggest commercial center of the world. Amen? And Washington is where Athena, Ishtar... And guess what? Her capital is Washington, D.C. What does D.C. stand for? District of Columbia. Do you understand that's how it got its name? Yeah. Now, what do we do? Do we move to Australia? No. Although, if Hillary gets elected, I might. <laughs> I'm out of here. I've been asked to move to Singapore I don't know how many times. I just might go if she gets elected. God forgive me. I'm sorry. See, folks, these are not happenstance. These are things that are being done, but they're never explained to us. They're always, well, this is the, quote, American way. Now, we don't move to Australia, but I do want to tell you this, is that we stop worshiping America and the, quote, American way of life. Because I will give you, thus says the Lord, the American way of life has been changing. How many of you know it's been changing and it has not been getting better? But I want you to understand that the American way of life is about to take a big step changing. One of those, I'll just give you, this is free, I won't charge anything for this. Is that some of you may or may not know, but the middle of next month, no, it's the middle of this month, banks can... And they have to by the first of the year. They have to. The deadline's the first of the year. Somewhere between the middle of this month and the first of January, 
they are moving the credit card companies, the banks that have credit cards, are taking their credit card debt and they are taking it from a 20-year amortization schedule and they're moving it to a 10-year amortization schedule. Does everybody understand the repercussions of that? In other words, right now, a $10,000 credit card would be roughly 2% of the balance or roughly $200 a month. By the 1st of January, that $200 payment that's on a 20-year amortization, when it goes to a 10-year amortization, that $200 payment becomes $400 without interest even going up. Now, I know they didn't tell you that when they you know, told you that you were pre-approved. And I want you to understand that that is the world. The world is the world is the world. And the world does what the world does. And God told us all about it in His Bible. And so He says, you watch out for the world. Here's what it looks like. But because we haven't gone back and studied His Word the way that we should, we're like all the bless me stuff. But when it comes to doing it God's way, I ah, don't bind me up with all that law stuff. God says, okay. I want to tell you what, and this isn't a rebuke or anything. Well, it might be a little bit. What it is, it's a wake up call. God is here to tell us that we need to wake up. We need to stop playing games with him. We need to find out what his word says. And we need to get on the stick. Amen. If you knew Jesus was coming at the end of the week, would you change the way you do things today? Absolutely. Now, Jesus, I don't believe, is coming at the end of the week, but I want to tell you what, things are about to change in the United States, and the God of the United States, the worship of the United States, that quote, that God of the United States, it's already starting to come down, but it's going to be shaken big time here in the next little while. Just wanted to throw that in there. Now, Washington, D.C. derives its name from George Washington and the Columbia goddess. Washington the District of Columbia. Now, George Washington, I believe, was a born-again, blood-bought believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I don't think there's any doubt about that. When you read his prayers, when you read his letters, and so on and so forth, the glory that he gives Jesus Christ, and his salvation, and by grace through faith, and so on and so forth, I don't think there's any question that he was a born-again, blood-bought believer. But I also believe that in ignorance... He worshipped at the altar of Baal at the same time because the tares got in. Amen? Tares can get in, and we don't know they've got in if we don't have the understanding. And unless we're just super sensitive spiritually, we don't pick up on it. How many of you know that sometimes something comes at you and you just, ooh, that just doesn't feel right? I don't understand why it doesn't feel right. I don't have to. I just know that isn't from the Lord. And then a month or two or even a year down the road or even longer, God gives us understanding. And we go, ah, that's why I didn't like that. Now I've got understanding with that witness I had in the Spirit. But if we're not super sensitive in the Spirit sometimes, we can just, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. oh yeah, Baal and Asherah, sure, no problem. Yeah, and we just do it out of ignorance. And the only time that God really gets mad at us is if we come to the understanding, and then we keep doing it. Okay? And so now, you guys, so you can't go home and say, I didn't know, because I just told you. Is that right? Yeah. You can see here, George Washington, this is a picture that's in one of the art galleries out in Washington. And here he is laying the foundation stone of the Capitol building. And for those of you who have seen them relay that twice in the last 20 years, you know that all the guys from Congress come out and they've all got their aprons on and they lay this foundation stone and it's a Masonic stone. It's got the compass and the square and so on and so forth etched in it. And this then merges the politics and the religion. Again, just like Ithbael merged politics and religion and even the financial, this is merging politics and religion. You must understand that the separation between church and state only goes to the separation of the Christian church and state. That's what the world is doing. You must understand that the religion of our government at this particular point in time, in many respects, is the religion of Baal and Asherah. Yeah, I'm sorry, it just is. That's the spirit that's taken the commandments out of the courthouses. That's the spirit that comes in and says it's okay to kill babies before they're born. 
That's the spirit that comes in and says it's okay for same-sex marriages. You must understand that's not the spirit of God. And that's why we as a people need to rise up and say, no. Amen? Yeah. This is George Washington's Masonic apron, and we're going to look at some of the occult symbols on this. The first one I want to deal with is the Eye of Osiris. And you can see this eye. The top picture is a picture in a French museum. But you can also see here, what's this right here? That's a reverse side of the great seal on the back of the U.S. $1 bill. And you must understand that this is not the eye of Yahweh. It is the eye of Osiris. That's what it is, okay? Let's take a look at the stars. Remember the Lord says, don't worship the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, and so on and so forth. Many times the worship of the constellation and the stars are represented by a five-pointed pentagram star. And it is the heart of nature worship, creation worship. And this right here, this is the pentagram of the elements. Did you ever see the movie The Fifth Element? This is the heart of that movie. So you've got the spirit, the air, the water, the earth, and fire, and so on and so forth. And the spirit represents the God force of the pantheon that binds the universe together and makes us all one with the creation. It is the new age. We are all God. God is all. God is all in all, and we are all in God, and God is in us. And uh, therefore, we are God. Gaia is Mother Earth, and we were created from Mother Earth. Therefore, we are God. That is the theology of the New Age. This is Wicca. Wicca uses the pentagram star as the center of earth worship. And you can see the star here. And just to let you know that right here is Asherah and this is Baal right here. Acts 7, quoting from Amos chapter 5, 26, says this. God is speaking to his people Israel. He says, you also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship them. And the star Rampha was put on the head of all of Israel's idols. And the only place we see that really manifesting today is in Satan worship. In fact, the star of Rampha is the third eye of Satan worship. And this is the imagery of Satan worship. It's called Baphomet. And Baphomet's head is the goat of Mendez, which now becomes an upside-down pentagram. Does everybody see that? And the goat's head is in the middle of it. This is the order of the eastern star, which is the Freemasonry's auxiliary for women. How many of you see the goat's head in that? The upside-down star. That is not a coincidence. Okay, You must understand there are no coincidences in this stuff. Oh, man, even on a Baptist church bulletin advertising or promoting Christmas, what do we got there? Don't we have an upside-down star in the midst of a circle? The circle always represents the sunburst. And there's the upside-down star right there. Now you say, well, they certainly don't worship Baal. That's right, they don't. But they have the imagery of that. And God says you won't worship them and use their imagery the way that they worship and use the imagery to their gods. And this is why God is coming in with the house cleaning. Remember Elijah said to Ahab, you're the one who's troubled your father's house because you and your fathers, you broke the commandments of God. See, and all I'm doing and all God is trying to do is he's saying, come on back to my commandments because that's the place of safety. That's the place of blessing. That's the place where I'll prosper you. He said, if you obey my commandments, I'll prosper you. The star of Rampha is emerging in the economical and political realm. Imagine that. See, we're bringing this home now. Now, this is Europe, many tongues, one voice. This was the official poster of the European Union. When they were coming into the Union and, and doing the Maastricht Treaty and, and solidifying it, this was their poster, and you can see right here. What is that? That's a modern-day version of the 14th century painting that I showed you earlier of the Tower of Babel. Boy, I'll tell you, that's not the Spirit of God, would you say? No. And so what you've got is you've got the economic aspects of things, you've got the political down here, and also the workers. And look what you got up here. 
Wow, those same upside down stars. The goat of Mendez star. And how many of them are there? I'll save you the time. There's 11. There's an Antichrist that's coming. Is that right? And he's going to emerge and he's going to rule over how many kings? Ten kings. And I just want to submit to you that whether they knew it or not, the spirit of the world that was leading these people to do this, to put it together, you must understand, not everybody understands what they're doing, but they're just being led by the spirit of the world, and it's giving them inspiration for this. Just like the spirit of God leads us, is that right? Has the spirit of God ever led you without you knowing what you're doing? Yeah, all the time. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, well, the same spirit of the world that leads men and women of the world has led them to do this. So please understand, I'm not saying everybody's in a, everybody that does stuff like this or is working like this is in conspiracy with the devil. They are. They, a lot of people just don't know it. And I want to tell you this. There are some who are absolutely, and they know exactly what they're doing. They are serving Lucifer in opposition to Yahweh because Lucifer has deceived them into believing that he already killed his son and he's wreaking havoc throughout the world. And he's going to defeat Yahweh in the end. Oh, are they in for a big surprise? But if we don't understand God's plan, we can say, boy, Yahweh doesn't seem very powerful to me. Maybe I had to get over in this boat. Okay, now, kids, children, listen up. This is primarily for you, because you are the primary targets of this next little ditty that I'm going to do here. We already know that the upside-down star represents the goat of Mendez, Baphomet, and the star of Ramphah. And when you take this triangle part on the center of this star, and you turn that upside down, oh, look at that. That's a face. Kids, who is that? That's Yoda, honey. you got to understand, Yoda, that little old lovable guru of the force, is a demon god. And we take our kids to the movie, and then we go to McDonald's, and we go through and we get a Yoda Happy Meal with a little Yoda idol in it. Repent! And we wonder why our kids are running off half-cocked. Kids... Stay away from the UFO alien stuff. It is not of God. It is a demon manifestation. There are no extraterrestrials. If the Bible is true, there is no such thing as an extraterrestrial. I can't teach on that because I'm I'm behind schedule already. What I have done is I've done a teaching on this whole thing. It's called the Report from Roswell. I was invited to go down this year at 4th of July and speak at one of the UFO conferences and bring a biblical perspective of this. Yeah, I was. Only God, only God. I'm telling you, only God. Amen? In fact, next month I'm going to Wyoming and I'm speaking to the Assemblies of God Youth Convention on this very subject. The pastor, he's a pastor in in Wyoming, but he's also the overseer for all the youth in Wyoming for the Assemblies of God, called me and he said, I saw your teaching from Roswell that you did. Somebody gave him a copy of what I did. And he said, I want you to come up. And he said, I want you to minister at our convention. He's given me all of Friday night, as much time as I need, as much altar time at the front to get these kids to repent and come back to God and leave these things in the dust. The report from Roswell, parents, if you ever get your kids anything, get them that and let them watch, make them watch it. If they don't want to watch it, just tell them watch it anyway. They'll love it because it's all, I mean, really good pictures and stuff. So it's entertaining. All right. The occult also uses sacred pillars of Baal in worship, going back to the Masonic apron of George Washington. This is a picture of Israel worshiping at the sacred pillars of Baal that are crowned with the sun and the Asherim. You can see right here, these are little images of Asherah, the ones that I showed you earlier. And then here's the images of the sun. There's a sunburst. Sure, question. You have to understand that it's a Gnostic 
type of religion. And Gnosticism basically says this. It's a teaching of Balaam. It's a teaching of the Nicolaitans. And the bottom line is this. As long as you have the blood of Jesus, the Savior, you don't have to obey the Old Testament commandments. In other words, what Jesus did on Calvary's cross conquered these things, so now we can worship them in the name of Jesus and use them whatever way you want. Paul criticized that hard in Second Peter. Jesus says that's the teaching of Balaam, and that's what Jezebel teaches. And it's like I said, it's very, very clear. And you'll see more. We're going to get into the actual celebrations. I'm still dealing with the secular and societal aspects because we're not talking about a religious group here, although it is very religious. We're talking about a fraternal organization. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't even got to the religious side. Next week's going to just blow your minds. Here is a Roman rendition of Mystery Babylon atop the sacred pillars of Baal. You can see the political with the king. You can see the religious with the priest. And then you can see the economic with the harvest there. Do you see that? Everything is being lifted up so that we can come and worship it. And only he, Jesus, is high and lifted up. Hold the sacred pillars of Baal in the American culture. Take a look at that one. Holy cats. You talk about sacred pillars with Columbia or Ishtar or Asher or whatever you want to call her, perched on top the sacred pillars of Baal. Oh, man, a picture is worth a thousand words now that we understand it, isn't it? You see, folks, this is the world. And 1 John chapter 2, and verse 15 and 16 says the world is passing away. And I just want to tell you this. If you're trying to hang on to it, you'll pass away with it too. And I'm not reading into anything because God's word is very clear about that. See, it's more than just the new birth. The new birth gets us saved. But now we have to walk as saved people. The new birth imputes the righteousness of God to us, but now we need to walk righteously and not in the way of our pagan ancestors. Because, see, the bottom line is, is that if we worship any other gods and have other idols, God says very, very clearly, the sins and the iniquities of the fathers will be visited upon the children to the third and the fourth generation. And so if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your kids. And kids, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your kids. I know it's hard to think more than a week down the road, but we've got to do that. Marduk's head carving provides the imagery for his most sacred pillar. Now, I'm going to share something very, very, very mature here. But we got to deal with it. Amen? How many of you know when something gets hard, we have to stop sweeping it under the rug? We've got to pull it out and say, this is of God or it's not of God. Because if it's not of God, it'll kill us. Amen? This is a picture earlier of Marduk on the right-hand side. And then this is one of the head carvings of Marduk, a very, very ancient one. And if you look, and I'm not going to verbalize it, but look right here. Now look at this. His most famous and most sacred pillar is the obelisk or the phallic symbol. The word obelisk, and this comes from Masonic and Occult Symbols, illustrated by Dr. Kathy Burns, page 341. It says this, The word obelisk literally means Baal's shaft or Baal's organ of reproduction. And you go, oh, how sick and how gross. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sick and gross. It's the devil. It's sick and gross, isn't he? Here's another one. This is at the Luxor Temple in Egypt. Because, see, the same thing, that other one was in Egypt. The same thing happens all over. Here's one in Caesarea in Israel. Wow. Where was Jezebel and Ithbel stationed? They were stationed in that area in Phoenicia, in and around. Caesarea was one of their provinces. Does everybody understand this? We're talking about Baal worship here. Oh, man. And, of course, the most famous phallus, Right in the United States of America, in Washington, District of Columbia. Here's another one I wanted to show you. Baal's most sacred pillar is also a symbol in pagan Christianity. Now, hold on to your hats. Do you see those two little gems? Yeah. I'm not even going to describe it. You can figure it out yourself. 
But you know what makes it okay? Is that they put a cross on the top. So what we've done is we've Christianized a very perverse, very pagan symbol. We said, oh, Jesus died on the cross to redeem that. You understand that you can only redeem what was yours and this was never God's in the first place. Does everybody hear me? If you hear me, say amen. Amen Amen or oh me. Love me or hate me. Accept it or reject it, but you're not going to change it. Okay? Now, Baal's sacred animal is the bull. And you can see, again, Isis always was lifting up Baal in large part. This is in a, a museum. Most of your archaeologists and so on and so forth believe that this was the image of the calf in the wilderness, the golden calf in the wilderness. It had the sunburst between the horns right here. And you can even see this one here has the serpent. Who's the serpent represent? Not Jesus. Okay, hallelujah. Now, Europe's sacred animal is the bull. This is a report on the EU when it was first coming out. It had the woman riding on a bull. Ooh, what's that sound like? Revelation 17, doesn't it? The woman on the beast. On their money. Right here, there's a woman on the back of a beast, a bull. Same way with their stamps, right here. Woman on a bull. Ho! People say, well, yeah, Europe is the center for the Antichrist when he comes. Well, no. Remember? District of Columbia. You have to understand, it's the whole world. See, when Antichrist comes, he's going to be ruler over more than just Europe. He's going to be ruler of the whole world. And that's why the devil permeates every aspect of society. So he can bring it together under a one world rule. And you say, yeah, but that's pretty obvious that that's Europe is the center of the beast. Well, America has its sacred animal, too. Wall Street has its bull. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, Wall Street worships the bull market. And that's no bull. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to know that I could go on for hours proving to you how Baal and Asherah worship. And we'll we'll do some more of that next week on the religious side. But I could go on for hours and show you how in every society, Baal and Asherah has penetrated and more or less taken over and taken the lead of where this thing is going. You just have to believe me when I say that I could do that in absolute proof. I believe that I've proved it here tonight. So... Let's now, in preparation for our next session that we do, let's talk just briefly about the pagan holidays. I'm going to go back to the Wicca. This is a a website. It's called The Witch's Voice. Popular Pagan Holidays, the Turning of the Wheel of the Year. And we're dealing with the quarterly celebrations, the winter solstice, the Yule, the spring equinox, which is Esther, and the summer solstice, and then also the fall equinox, Maban. These are celebrations that witches keep. Okay? Everybody say witches. Do we have any witches in here? Okay, then we better not be keeping any of these feasts. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The cross-quarterly celebrations are embolic. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's what it's called. Beltane, and Bel derives its name from like Babel, and Marduk, one of his later names, was also Bel. That's where Baal came out of as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Loomis, and then Samhain. Ooh, look at Samhain. What is that? Yeah, October 31st. Look at Beltane. May Day. Oh, boy. Do you realize that May Day is Satan's highest holy day? Yeah. It's a higher holy day than Halloween. Yeah, it is. And I don't have time to go into that. You just have to trust me. Let's see what the witches say about the winter solstice, the Yule. Yule is the time of greatest darkness and the longest night of the year. The winter solstice has been associated with the birth of a divine king long before the rise of Christianity. Imagine that. The witches and the pagans, in fact, this isn't just witches, this is on a witch's website, but what holidays are these called? Pagan holidays. The pagans, of all the different pagan denominations, understand that Yule is associated with, and I'll read it again, the birth of a divine king 
long before the rise of Christianity. Since the sun is considered to represent the male divinity, and we're going to talk more about that in the next session, in many pagan traditions, this time is celebrated as the return of the sun god where he is reborn of the goddess. And you say, wow, I'd like to know more about that. How many of you like to know more about that? Come back next week, because we're going to talk about that. The mystery of Babylon, you must hear me. The mystery of Babylon, the very heart, the very mystery of Babylon, is deep within the understanding of the Yule celebration. And if we fail to understand that in these last days and come away from it, when we stand before the Lord, we will be guilty of eating at the table of Jezebel with Baal and Asherah. And if we really, really, really believe that Jehovah, Yahweh, is God, and we really, really, really believe that Jesus is His Son, and that He died and then rose from the dead, and we really, really, really believe that His Word is everlasting, and that heaven and earth will pass away, or this world will pass away before one jot or tittle of His Torah, His law passes away, that's what Jesus said, then you know what? We've got to make some changes in our lives. How many of you know God loves you too much to leave you the way you are? Amen? Because He's changing us from glory to glory into His image, not this image.